Okay, well welcome. Today we're gonna to be talking about secrets to growing herbs. So one of my favorite topics, one of my favorite things to do is grow herbs. If you have never grown an herb before, it's one of the easiest, I think almost entry level things that you can do for the edible garden. I mean, we talk a lot about edible gardens when it comes to you know lettuces, collards, kales, beets, carrots, all of your coal crops. And then of course your summer vegetables, your squash, zucchini, tomatoes, um, peppers, huge list of, of both of those when you come to like your vegetables. And then of course there's fruits and berries and fruit trees and figs and so many different things that we've discussed throughout all of these webinars that we've done. Uh, but I love to talk about herbs because I always tell people if you're thinking about getting into the, the edible gardening, uh, herbs are where I would always start. They're easy. They're not super expensive. They don't take very long. You don't have to worry about doing something super specific. You're gonna hear me talk about this a lot, but uh, herbs are great because you're growing them for the leaves. And leaves are pretty easy to produce. You don't have to worry about trying to get it to flower. In fact, a lot of times we're trying to prevent it from flowering. Um, so herbs are one of my favorite go-tos for the edible gardener, especially for somebody that's just starting out. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today is just kind of uh, some of my secrets to growing very, very good herbs. Um, and I've got lots of tips and tricks that I'll scatter throughout this entire webinar, but also really just to give you kind of a 101 on growing herbs. So if you're uh, uh, somebody that's new, that's just coming uh, uh, you know, into this uh, uh, herb gardening phenomena, uh, then uh, hopefully you'll learn a lot. If you've done herb gardening for a long time, um, then hopefully you'll pick up on some of the tips and tricks that I scatter throughout this presentation, uh, some things that I have learned over my many, many years of growing herbs, um, my successes, my failures. I share all of those with you. You'll have successes, you'll have failures. It's okay, that's part of gardening, and we all learn from it. Um, so it's gonna be a great time to talk about that, and herbs are just so much fun. One reason that I love herbs is they're versatile. You can grow them virtually anywhere. Um, so we'll talk about sunlight and requirements and all of that here in a minute. But where you can grow herbs is what I love about them. Uh, you can grow them in the ground, of course. So you can see that image there of, a, of an herb garden right there growing right in the ground. You can grow them in rows. You can grow them in huge batches. You can actually scatter them in your landscape. There's some amazing looking herbs that you can grow in your landscape. Think of rosemary, lavender. I mean, those are amazing plants. Even uh, sage is a gorgeous little evergreen shrub. Uh, so there's a lot of great examples. Mint is a ground cover. We'll talk about how aggressive that is, and, and of course we'll get into mint here in a little bit. Uh, but you can grow them pretty much anywhere, and in the ground is a great option. You can also grow them in containers. So you can grow them in pots. You know, I love terracotta. Of course, that's what I've kind of surrounded myself with here today. Uh, growing in terracotta, it's, it's efficient, it's easy, it's a little bit longer standing than maybe like a plastic container. Plastic's perfectly fine. We've got raised beds. That's another form of growing in a container, right? So a raised bed is a great option because you get to control the soil. The soil warms up a little bit quicker. You get a little bit growth faster. So raised bed gardening is a great option. And there's so many different other ways that you can do it. And of course, growing them indoors is also an option. So no matter where you live, no matter what your, your growing space is, you can probably grow herbs uh, because they're pretty small. A lot of them are pretty small and compact. Um, a lot of them have seasonality that you can grow during different seasons. Um, and some of them are even evergreen that we can plant out in our landscape. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail as I get to the actual specific plants. But the nice thing about herbs is they're versatile and you can pretty much grow them anywhere. Uh, let's talk about soil types. So soil is super important. Um, I always talk about soil pretty much every time I talk about any plant uh, because that's where the plant's gonna live. So it's just like we would invest in our homes. You need to invest in the soil that your plant is going to live in for the entirety of its life. Whether it's a short-lived seasonal plant or an annual, or whether it's a perennial or in the ground. You know, we need to invest in the soil in its home where its root system is gonna live and where it's gonna thrive best. And so of course, you read any label on any plant, it's almost always gonna say moist, well-drained soil. Well, let's talk about our natural soil here in the Hampton Roads area at least, and probably across a majority of the country, uh, is clay-based. And so clay-based soils um, are very thick and heavy um, they're actually pretty good soils. They actually hold in a lot of nutrients. The downfall is they can become very hard and compacted when it's dry, but they can also become very waterlogged when it's wet. So what we want to do is we want to amend our soil. We want to amend it with compost, which is basically what this picture is up here. You can see it's just a brown dirt. Topsoil is okay. Topsoil will raise your level. 
I tend to like compost because compost is gonna add organic matter and that's what our soil lacks is organic matter. So the compost is gonna add that. It's also gonna break apart your clay soil, which is what the perlite's gonna do. So perlite is really, really important. You see it in potting soils. So the farthest picture over there is a potting soil. And potting soil is gonna be a mix of composted bark matter, peat moss, vermiculite, perlite, and so it's gonna have all of those blended together. Now in the ground, we wanna keep our soil because the plant's gotta live there. It's gotta figure out how to deal with our soil, but we can amend it and make it a little bit of a nicer environment, at least to get started in, but maybe even further beyond that. Depends on how much you wanna do. Do you wanna amend the entire bed or do you wanna amend just the hole? And both forms are very, very successful and very, very good. But compost, perlite, and our soil. Uh, even if you've got sandy soil, sandy soil is not a bad soil either. Uh, you know, the best way that I can describe the difference between sand and clay is clay, imagine like a big bin of golf balls. Try and put your hand through that. Not a whole lot of pockets, not very easy to move through, but then put your hand through a big bin of volleyballs. A lot bigger pockets, easier to get your hand down through there. And so that's what sand is. Sand needs to be kind of tightened up a little bit. Compost does that. What you would omit in that situation is perlite. You might add some peat moss, um, you might add some different types of things, earthworm castings, you might use different types of compost, like mushroom compost um, is a good one that's a little bit thicker and is gonna be a little bit uh, tighter, which is gonna help kind of bring that soil together. So you got sandy soils, we need to almost, I don't wanna say thicken it up, but we need to add some water holding capacity because sand is gonna allow a lot of water to drain through very quickly. If we're in a clay-based soil, then we're trying to break it up and free it up a little bit to allow uh, water to percolate through, but also to allow uh, air to get in there because roots need air as well. Now, potting soil is very, very important. Whenever we're growing in a container, we've got to use a potting soil. Don't use a garden soil. Garden soils are basically a mix of compost and perlite, but a potting soil is designed for containers. So if you're gonna decide to grow in containers, then that's basically what you want, is you wanna get a, a potting soil. Of course, we sell some great uh, uh, selections here at McDonald Garden Center. We have our own private uh, brand that we um, uh, have specifically designed for Hampton Roads that we know is gonna be very good. We've got a natural and organic and an all-purpose. So those are great potting soils. But if you're getting a soil to put in a container, it's gotta be a potting soil. Now, raised beds are kind of a, a mix of both. You don't have a native soil except what's below the bed if you're just putting a, you know, a, a raised bed on top of your existing soil. But what you get to do is you get to build your own potting soil in there. Now you can fill it with just straight potting soil. That's perfectly fine because you're getting good drainage. You don't have to worry about that. Now let me stop here and just throw out a tip or a trick. Don't use potting soil in the ground. And so in a raised bed it's okay because you're going to get good drainage. You're going to get airflow. Potting soils are designed with a wetting agent to help prevent that soil from really hardening off and becoming like a cake ball. So, you know, it takes a long period of drought, a long period of us not watering it or no rainfall for a potting soil to really become unmanageable to use. And that's because a wetting agent is in there to help keep that soil uh, having some moisture content in it. If you use that in the ground, that a uh, wetting agent is going to cause too much moisture to be held. Basically, it's almost like if you've ever bought like a soil moist or any of those water holding crystals that we put into our soil, you don't want to use those in the ground because our soil sometimes can get too wet and it holds on to too much water. So don't use a potting soil in the ground, use a compost and perlite. Potting soil in a raised bed, perfectly fine, or you can build your own, especially if you got big raised beds that you're building and you need bulk soil, we can help you figure all of that out. Uh, you just come in and talk to any of our garden experts here at McDonald Garden Center and give us your length and your width and your height and we can tell you exactly how much you need of bulk topsoil, bulk compost, perlite, peat moss, vermiculite, whatever you wanna add in there. We've got like seven different types of compost. So we've got lots and lots of different options and that's why people love raised beds is because you get to develop the soil that it grows in. Um, and that's what's so cool about it. And of course, all the benefits of the soil temperature warming up, which means you get a little bit quicker reaction in the spring. And you also get to uh, work with the nutrients a little bit better. It makes it a little bit easier on your back and it prevents insects and diseases a little bit better from getting in there and getting kind of established. All right, so soils are important. Make sure you invest in your soil just as much as you invest in your plants. 
Sunlight, of course, every plant needs light, right? So sunlight is a tricky one with herbs. I won't say tricky, but a versatile, a, a nice one because while the, yes, they love full sun. They would prefer six to eight hours of full sun, a majority of them. However, some actually grow in very good low light situations, five to six hours, maybe even as low as four hours. And one of the reasons that I love growing in containers like this is because I can move them around as the season progresses. And what's really nice about growing in containers is sometimes they'll put on a show. Like I've got you know some lavender here that's putting on this amazing flowering show, and then I can bring it up closer. I can put it on you know my picnic table or or my my outdoor dining table, and then I've got this really gorgeous little show that I can put on, and then I can take it away when I don't want it there. So it gives you a lot of versatility. I'll talk a little bit about. Uh, the deterrent ability of some of these herbs here in a little bit, um, but that's another great option to grow them in containers. You can help them with the sunlight, you can move them for the sunlight, but you can also bring them closer when you're having a party and you're on your deck and you wanna grow some lemongrass uh, that might help deter some of the mosquitoes and different types of insects that might be bothering you during your dinner party. So lots of great benefits to herbs um, and we'll go through a lot of those, but sunlight is an important one. So pretty much when you get below three hours of sunlight, you're gonna struggle. Now what I also wanna talk about sunlight, why I put that little compass picture in there is because if you're gonna grow indoors, it's important to understand the north, east, west, west south, positioning of your windows. And so it's good, you know, nobody probably has a compass like that anymore, but we all have smartphones these days and a smartphone has a compass app usually in it. And you can go and you can find out exactly which window it is that you wanna grow herbs in and what kind of sunlight you're gonna get. So let's talk about that. North windows are always gonna get the least amount of light. And that's because the sun rises in the east. So the east window is gonna get the morning sun. The west window is gonna get the afternoon sun. The south and north are trickier. North windows are typically not gonna get much sunlight. And that's because the, the sun is always tilted a little bit towards the south side of your home. And so the south side is gonna get almost all day sun. It's usually gonna be your hottest period. Now I put that image of the tree with that dapple sunlight coming through because it's important to know where your trees are. Your trees are gonna block a lot, of, a lot of the light. Now here in Hampton Roads, our trees haven't quite leaped out yet, but they will. So know where those trees are and how much light they're gonna block. Now, sometimes even through trees, you can get good light. Think of pine trees. I always think of pine trees. You know, growing underneath pine trees is pretty easy. Not only do they have a good root system to allow you to grow in, but they also are such a high canopy typically that it allows plenty of light underneath it. It's not a huge big canopy like an oak or a maple is gonna provide, um, but a pine tree, great option. You know, sometimes you might live in a wooded area where you've got a couple trees, but you're on the edge and it's gonna get a good amount of sun in the afternoon, especially if, you're, if your tree line is facing south or west. You're gonna, it's gonna get shaded in the morning, but then once it gets up over top of those trees and gets into that, that, that westerly pattern, then you're gonna get more sun. But it's important to know the direction of your sun. It's important to know how much sun you're getting. And we'll talk about some of the varieties that need, that can actually take a little bit less sun as we get into some of the varieties here towards the end. So just kind of keeping it super, super basic and simple right now. Let's move on to plant food. So of course, Herbs are gonna to need to be fed, just like any plant is, especially when we talk about containers. So let's start there. Container growing herbs, I absolutely love it. It's one of my favorite things to do with herbs is grow them in containers. Um, I don't have a ton of in-ground space. I might grow some of my bigger, longer standing ones like lavender or rosemary, but in a pot, I love to grow you know, something smaller like a basil or a cilantro or a thyme or oregano, any of those. Um, but they do need to be fed. And the reason is, is because in a container, you've got drainage holes, right? You've got a hole down at the bottom, and that means your nutrients are going to work their way through the soil much faster than if you were growing in the ground. Now in the ground, you still need to feed your plants. The good news about feeding a, uh, uh, an herb is that it doesn't need super, super specific things. It really only needs nitrogen for the most part. Yeah, giving it some trace elements is really important. So I'm gonna actually go to full screen here so I can show you a couple different things here. Uh, when we get to plant foods, I always like to kind of explain this. It's really, really helpful. It was what helped me really understand how plant foods work. So green leaf is our, is our go-to. It's one of my favorite ones. I use it on all my herbs. I absolutely love it. And the reason I do is because it's a 12-4-8. It's higher in nitrogen, which means it's gonna give it green growth. So when we talk about the three numbers on the front of any fertilizer, is going to gonna tell you kind of what it's gonna do for you. 
And so like a blooming and rooting formula, something that's gonna force blooms, a flower tone, any of those are gonna have a higher middle number. That's phosphorus. So that's gonna give you roots and blooms. In this case, we don't necessarily want, I mean, yes, we wanna develop a root system, but we don't wanna force it to bloom. Most of, our, um, most of our herbs, we really want it for the greenery. And we're gonna talk a lot about why we want greenery because we're gonna use it to cook with typically. Sometimes you might want the flowers, some herbs, yes, we use flowers, but typically you're gonna want the leaves and that's what you're looking for. In fact, a lot of times with cilantro, uh, basil, we wanted to prevent it from blooming because once it does that, it's kind of fizzling out on us. So, but green leaf is one of my favorites because it's high in nitrogen. And then the last number is potassium and that's gonna be an all around protector. And what that's gonna really help with is during those winter time frames when a plant might be a little bit more stressed due to cold temperatures. So whenever you buy a plant food, always look at those three numbers. You've also got our organic green leaf, which is a great one too. This is a really nice one because it's an 824. Now eight is pretty high for an organic uh, of plant food. So really, really nice uh, formula that gives you the nitrogen that you want to keep your plants green and producing green leaves. So these are great options here, uh, our organic green leaf and our traditional green leaf. Now, what I also love is if I can stay organic, I love to try and stay organic if possible, is organic biotone starter. So you saw that on that image because if you're planting herbs this spring, you throw a little bit of this in there. I, I'm gonna say it for pretty much every single plant that we grow here at McDonald Garden Center, that we sell here at McDonald Garden Center, get yourself a bag of Biotone Starter. It's amazing the benefits that you will get from it. It's absolutely stunning. Uh, in fact, eventually you'll probably say, why would I have never used this before? But what this has in it is, of course, a plant starter fertilizer. So it's got a 433. So it's a little bit high in nitrogen, but it's really, really a nice evenly balanced uh, plant food. But really the benefit of it is the bacteria, the beneficial bacteria and soil microbes that are in here. It's absolutely amazing. Mycorrhizae, you might have heard that name thrown out before, but these are little organisms, basically little beneficial bacterias that attach themselves to the root system of your plant and form a symbiotic relationship. And basically what they're doing is they're taking things from the plant that they don't want and they're giving things back to the plant that they do want. And that can stay with that plant for the entirety of its life. So it's a really, really amazing thing. You're gonna see a lot better water holding capacity because that root system is gonna expand very quickly. So it's a really, really cool one. It's gonna help the longevity of your plants and it's gonna get them established much quicker. So try Biotone Starter. It's completely organic um, and it's a really, really good option to start with and then you can come through with a green leaf, whether you use the traditional or the organic. Now there's lots and lots of other plant foods you can use. I even grabbed this like little bottle of Schultz here. You know, sometimes when we're growing in containers or especially indoors, we might want just a quick little shot of liquid food. And this is a good one because it's a 10, 15, 10. A little higher in the middle number, but it's just a nice even formula. And of course I love our Fertilome water soluble. So you can get it straight liquid that you just drop a couple drops in a, in a watering can, or you can do a water soluble that you mix up with water. This is a 20 20 20, super, super basic, simple formula. Um, now, I will, because I miss this and I always talk about this, with our green leaf, what you're going to get are some of the smaller trace elements, some of those smaller things that you don't see in some of the big fertilizers. Of course, we got our nitrogen, our phosphorus, our potassium, the big three, the main three that you have to have. But there's also some smaller ones like molybdenum, iron, zinc, all of these different things, copper. There's a lot of different things in here that help. And they're small trace elements, but small. If you're missing a bunch of small things, then it really can impact it. So that's why I love our green leaf. All right. Done my spiel on plant food. It's important. It's not an overall end-all be-all with, with uh, herbs, amazingly. Herbs really can take pretty much anything. I forgot to mention it when, I, when we talked about soil, but we talk about pH a lot when we talk about soil, especially in ground. In containers, it's usually pretty neutral, so you're pretty safe. But herbs are versatile. That's why I love them. We don't have to, we don't have to worry, worry, worry so much about getting everything super, super perfect uh, because even the pH is a pretty wide range. A 5.5 to a 7 is pretty much where you're at. I mean, that's really pretty much all of our average soil pHs here in the Hampton Roads area. So you can probably you know, walk right out, throw a little bit of compost, a little perlite in a hill, plant your rosemary, and you probably never really have to worry about it too much. It's really that easy to grow. All right, so let's go back to, we finished up our feeding of plants, so let's talk about pruning a little bit. All right, here's one of my favorite tips and tricks is use it or lose it. I'll say it a hundred times. People are probably sick of me saying it, um, but 
Herbs love to be cut. That's what's so great about it, is you want to use them. Typically what happens people when they're unsuccessful with herbs is they cut the herb uh, one time and then they forget about it, they forgot they planted it and they don't use it and then all of a sudden they go out to use it and it's gotten big, overgrown, it started to flower, it's petered out, you know, a lot of different things. And a lot of times your, your herbs will stay bushier when you prune them and you keep them nice and tidy and tight. Uh, they'll actually do better and they'll perform better for you. And a lot of times as plants get bigger and older and mature, they will begin to flower. And especially, I mean, there's a certain few that obviously we don't want to, and that's, I'm gonna mention them a, a, a bunch of times. Cilantro, basil, those are typically ones. Now a lot of that is heat activated, daylight activated. When we get warm, there's almost no preventing it. Another great reason to grow in containers because we can start to move it into a little bit of a cooler location if we have one around our home. You know, sometimes you get those little microclimates where you can grow something a little bit longer into the season. Um, and so those are great options. Uh, there's other ways of doing that. And we'll talk about that here in a second. But pruning is important. And there's a couple ways, of course, to do it. And I've got, you know, of course, just your basic pair of pruners. Uh, you can buy lots and lots of different types of snips. What you always want is a bypass pruner. And so that's probably the most important thing that I'll tell you about pruners. Bypass pruners, the blades bypass. In fact, this is actually not even a blade here on this side. This is the only blade, but uh, it bypasses the other one rather than an anvil pruner. Anvil pruners, you almost don't even see anymore. I don't even sell an anvil pruner, uh, but an anvil pruner is gonna be kind of like a flat mallet, and then the blade goes right into it and stops. And what happens is the mallet side crushes the stem while the blade side cuts it. So you get a lot more crushed stem. So just a pair of bypass pruners. You can use scissors for most herbs. You know, you really don't have to worry about it. There's some that will get a little bit woodier over time. So that's kind of important to kind of realize that, yeah, you'll get some woodiness in there um, that you want to be careful about. Um, and you might need a pair of pruners that are a little bit stronger than scissors. But really what I love to talk about whenever we talk about herbs are our herb scissors. So these are our herb scissors made by Escher. They're absolutely amazing. They're really cool because just like a bypass pruner, just like scissors, right? That's what you want. You can use those to cut, but look at this. These guys have five pairs of scissors in one. So you see that action right there? So what you can do with this is you can actually take your herbs, set them on a table, and just chop up the leaves with your scissors, and you've got nice and cut up uh, herbs all ready to go right into your dishes uh, whenever you're cooking. So really, really great uh, pair of scissors here. Our herb scissors are really awesome to use. Uh, you'll love them, and um, whether you're really, really good with a chef's knife or not, uh, herb scissors will save you some time um, and some of that hassle, especially when it gets to like, you know, thyme is always one of my favorites. Um, I love to use thyme, but it's that tiny little leaf, right? And so it's really hard to kind of get that all chopped up. So I like to strip off as much of it off the stem as I can, and then go through with those herb scissors and just chop it up as tight as I can, so I got the nice little fine pieces. You can use a knife, of course, but uh, I love these herb scissors. They're just a great option. All right, let's talk about storing for a second. Um, in fact, let's do one other thing real quick because I'm missing a couple kind of tips and tricks as I go along here. Let's talk about watering because I, I didn't make a slide for watering, uh, but watering is obviously very important. So watering your herbs is one thing that you're definitely gonna have to do. So if we're growing in the ground, let's start with growing in the ground. In the ground, you're gonna to wanna to water every two to three days for the next two to three weeks after you plant. And that typically is gonna be an, enough water to really get them pretty established. Now, of course, we're gonna to have to watch it after that. So we're gonna to wanna, to, we're, we're, what we're doing is we're pushing the plant to find its own water. That's the best way I can describe how to water in the ground is we gotta push the plant to find its own water. If we walk by it every day and give it a little dash of water, Great, it'll survive, but then all of a sudden we go out of town for the weekend and it says, where's my water? I didn't go find it myself, I was always getting a little bit. Um, so what we wanna do is we wanna push our plants to find their own water. So we're gonna water it deep less often. So water it really deep every two to three days. I like to push it to the third day if I can. Uh, so you're watering about two, maybe three times a week for about the first two to three weeks. And then we want to cut back. Not super drastically, but we want to cut back. So it depends on the temperature, depends on a lot of different variables. And you know, the best tool that you got is your finger. So you can always check the soil. If it's really, really dry on the top two to three inches, then you might need to water. Um, but uh, you want to water deep less often in the ground. And that's the best way to explain it. Soaker hoses, 
Sprinkler systems are okay. Sprinkler systems, you know, for plants typically aren't great. Sprinkler systems are really designed for lawns because most plants don't want water all over their leaves during the day. Um, so we want to water the root system. That's the most important thing. And that's where I always bring out my DRAM watering wand. This is the best tool out there. It's super, super easy to use. It comes with an on and off valve so you can stop watering anytime and then start watering again. And it's got this nice long handle. I believe it's 30 inches. Yep, 30 inches. So two and a half feet long. It's really, really nice. It's super handy. You can get hanging baskets like this rosemary hanging basket behind me. So I can water that really easily. Um, it's really, really nice and super handy and it saves your back a lot of trouble. Plus, the water breaker is really the genius behind this. The water breaker helps break that water and keeps your soil in the pot. I mean, how many times do we go out there and water, you know, with a hose in like a revolver and all the soil gets sprayed everywhere? Um, so this breaker up here really breaks that water, that's hence the name, and it keeps it nice and light right around the pot. It's like a little shower. So Dram, Dram Rain Wand, if you find us watering here at the garden center, we've got one of these in our hands. And so I always tell people, if people that water every single day are using a tool, you probably should use it too. So this is one of the best tools out there for watering. Plus, in containers, we're gonna need to water a little bit more. So whenever we grow in containers, they're gonna dry out faster. A container is above ground, therefore you're gonna have more evaporation, you're gonna have more airflow around it, so it's going to uh, evaporate quicker, the, the soil is going to lose moisture faster, plus it's got a major drain hole in it that's gonna allow the water to percolate through it, plus you're growing in a potting soil that's gonna drain well. So anything that you grow in a container or a hanging basket is gonna dry out a little bit faster, so we're gonna to have to water those and most of the times, uh, they're not super, super great water catchers. So, you know, in the ground, the soil temperature stays a little bit lower consistently, and that means the water holding capacity is gonna be a little bit better. Now, when we get into the heat of the summer where it's 100 degrees, you're, you're gonna be watering. It's just the, the, na the natural fact of it. Now, things like rosemary and lavender that we can get established, um, we might not have to worry about as much. Um, but in a container, we're definitely gonna to have to water. In the summer, you're watering daily. In the spring and fall, you're probably watering every two to three days. So it cuts back a lot. In the winter, we're probably barely watering, maybe once a week, maybe once or twice a month. So pretty, pretty low on the watering requirements. And it de depends again on the soil and how much the roots have filled up that soil. A lot of variables always. Uh, you've got your tool right here, so you can always check that soil. But watering is an essential part. I didn't. I failed to put that in my presentation there, so I wanted to address it. Um, and the DRAM watering one is my tip and trick. If you don't have one, you should get one. It'll save you a ton of time. Raised beds are kind of a mix. So similar thing as I talked about with the soil um, or versatility is in a raised bed, it's a little bit raised up, so you're gonna lose a little bit more moisture, a little bit faster than in the ground, but it definitely will hold more water than a container will because more soil capacity, so and a little bit lower to the ground, it's not gonna evaporate as quick but you just gotta watch it. And you gotta you know, kinda learn from what the plants are telling you. That's the nice thing too, is a lot of plants will tell you, especially lavender, rosemary, rosemary not so much, but lavender definitely will, rosemary will a little bit, but a lot of your leafy herbs, oregano, um, basil, they'll all start to wilt a little bit. If they're wilting and the soil's moist, don't water it, it's overwatered. you need to let it dry out. If it's wilting and the soil's dry, you need to water it. So pretty simple kinda technique there. Let's talk about storing because I think a lot of times, I mean, I did this with vegetables for sure. When I first started growing vegetables, I grew way too many. I had so much I didn't know what to do with and I didn't think about how to store them. So that is one thing to always consider. A little bit of planning, a little bit of preparing, thinking about how you're gonna grow your herbs is very, very important. But think about what you're gonna be doing as far as your herbs. Are you gonna grow so much that you're gonna have some to store through the winter season? Um, how are you gonna store it? Are you gonna freeze it? Are you gonna dry it? So I got a couple tips here for, for drying herbs. Um, but it's best to use fresh, uh, herbs throughout the season. They're more healthy for you and you've got a readyable supply of them. Um, as you get towards the end of the season is pretty much typically when you're going to want to start thinking about drying your herbs. Now some do better with drying, some do less as well. Uh, so we might consider freezing. So for example, think about the leaf and the moisture content in it. So a lot of times I'll tell people that um, a, a, a something like a chive or basil is gonna be better 
when you freeze it than it is gonna be to dry it because the moisture content is so high in it that it's actually gonna be better to freeze than it is to, to dry. Um, when you dry, you can do that more with you know, your rosemaries, your, your thymes, parsleys, uh, different types of things like sage is a little bit better. So let me see, I got my list here, let me make sure. So the ones that have more moisture uh, are basil, chives, mint, and tarragon. So those are really, really good options to, to freeze. For drying, you can pretty much do the rest of them. Ways to dry them, lots and lots of different ways. Of course, these are great examples here, just hanging them out uh, and letting them dry. What they want is warm, but they also want a little bit of shade. You don't, wanna, uh, you don't want to let them dry in full sun. So while this looks gorgeous, and I would do that, I would love to do that, you know, out in my yard or on a sunny patio or something, you know, line them up and let them hang and dry. Uh, they really do need a little bit of shade. So a lot of times people will actually wrap them in a brown bag. Make sure to poke a bunch of holes all throughout the brown bag, wrap them in the bag that keeps it protected from the sunlight, uh, but you can still get the warmth. So brown bag is a good option, but basically you just let them hang them and dry. Pretty, pretty easy. Uh, let's see, do I have any other notes in there? Oh, um, you can do it in a microwave. Um, or an oven, I know a lot of people that have tried that, but inevitably what happens when you do that is you're cooking it a little bit, and so when you cook an herb, you're gonna lose a lot of the flavor and a lot of the health benefits. So best way is to let it naturally dry. And a lot of times I tell people when drying, uh, or, or planning on how they're gonna store, is play with it, try a couple different methods, maybe try it throughout the season, see what time is the best time for you, um, because it's gonna really vary depending on where you're trying to dry and how you're trying to dry it. So lots and lots of different techniques out there, uh, but drying is a great option. And I typically recommend starting that in the fall season. So as our, you know, as our oregano starts to wind down, um, then it's a great time to do it. Now you can do it really any time of the year. If you've got a bumper crop, let's say you got a big crop of it in the summer, uh, and you got tons of oregano and you want to dry it, then great, great opportunity to do that uh, in the summer. So you can always do different things with it. All right, so let's go to uh, talking about our types of herbs. So lots and lots of different types of herbs out there. I'm gonna go through and, and take you to full screen again and show you some of my favorites and then we can get a little bit more in depth into some of what I've learned over the years, but also some of my favorite varieties. And I think that's one of the most important things is when you're starting, you know, whether you're new at it or whether you're experienced, uh, it's always good to know which ones that we have, which ones we carry, and which ones I would suggest so that you're most successful. So let's talk about some of those. Um, and I'll try and go somewhat in order if I can, uh, but I'll probably just grab some um, and just show them to you. I've got a nice big tray here. We carry the Chef Jeff varieties for almost a majority of what we uh, sell here. Why I love Chef Jeff is uh, it's been you know, tested. You know that they're all non-GMO, which is really nice, GMO free. So they haven't been genetically modified seeds or anything like that. We do carry some USDA certified organic herbs, um, but I always tell people, whether you're growing a non-GMO, organic, whatever you wanna do, when you get it home and you start growing it, you can grow it the way you like. And so if you wanna grow it completely organic, you can take it and do that. You can also grow from seed. So seed is a great option, and I brought these seeds. Uh, mainly, I brought cilantro and basil, because I will talk about that a lot, um, how we can use seed to help kind of ward off the, the dreaded word of bolting. You know, when our plants start to bolt and, and start to flower to try and go to seed, um, this might come in handy, and I'll tell you that trick when we get to those. But seeds are a great option too. Now seeds, you're gonna get a lot of seeds. So um, in here, let's see, this dill, 130 seeds in here. So some of us might say, I don't need 130 seeds of dill. I just wanna plant one dill plant, and here it is. And so I can just plant that one dill, and I'm good to go through the season. So it's really up to you but having seeds is very economical. It's a very easy way to do it. And most of them are pretty simple to start. Um, you can either start them indoors early in the season, or you can go and direct sow them once the soil temperature gets up. I usually say direct sow, you know, depending on the variety of what herb you're choosing, I usually say May 1st is about the kind of start date to be able to go out, pop it right into a pot of soil or something, you know, into a potting soil and just stick it, you know, outside and let it germinate or even directly in the ground, um, but you can do it seed starting wise inside as well. So seeds are a great option. Um, so, um, so that's a great one. So, but I love these Chef Jeff because a lot of times I just wanna try one 
and it's a great option. Very similar to what we do with our vegetables. Um, so Chef Jeff is a great one. And the reason that I also love Chef Jeff is all the information is right here on the back of the tag. So if you're ever curious about, you know, what kind of dishes maybe to use it in or, or what it does or how big it grows. So let's take this one for example. Let's start with basil. I've got one in my hand. So basil, of course, quintessential, one of the best um, herbs to grow. Um, it, you know, I think everybody always clamors to get the basil in as soon as pos po possible. It is an annual, so it's something that you're going to plant every year. It's not going to make it through our winters. Um, in fact, a lot of people probably plant it a little too early, uh, but basil is a really good one. It doesn't like temperatures below really 50, but it can take them down to almost 40. Um, so you just got to be careful with the earliness of basil. Basil is a little bit in that shorter lived seasonality uh, of growing herbs. And so what I mean by that is by the time summer hits, it's usually trying to flower and that means it's bolting. And not that it makes a lot of people, I think it's kind of a myth personally, I don't taste it at least, but the myth to me is that when it flowers, the leaves don't taste any good. It takes the flavor out of leaves. I don't know that I necessarily see that, but what I will say is when a plant, especially herbs like cilantro and basil, go to flower, that's where they dump all of their resources into. They pay, basically are almost saying, I'm on my way out, I'm gonna reproduce, I'm gonna flower, I'm gonna seed, and then I'm out. Um, so typically when it flowers, you're starting to run into that. Now you can get it through the flowering season and get it to keep on leafing out in the cooler season, but it's a difficult proposition, I, I will be honest. Um, so what we're always trying to do is kind of eliminate that flowering season uh, or push it. And so new varieties have come out that don't flower as much. This is a great one, this is a Greek columnar. So Greek columnar basil. It takes a little bit longer to flower, so it means it's gonna, gonna get it a little bit farther into summer before it does. I don't think I grabbed the Dolce Fresco, but that's another one of my favorites. This is the sweet basil, this is your common one. So really the biggest difference here in some of our basils, let me hold up the three that I grabbed. I think this is the Thai. So this is the Thai basil, a little bit spicier, a little bit of different leaf size. And then this is our sweet basil, huge big leaves. I mean, you gotta love it. I always say plant at least one sweet basil because it's gonna get big, you're gonna get nice big leaves, great for all of your uh, you know, different Italian dishes or whatever you wanna use your basil in. Uh, really, really good one because it's that big, huge leaf and it's got that sweet, sweet flavor. And then the Greek columnar, which is nice because it gets a little bit more columnar, a little bit tighter, and it's that little tiny leaf. So sometimes you might just need you know, a few leaves or you just wanna cut off a chunk of it, use it or lose it, I'm gonna say it 100 times, uh, cut it, and then that way you get this nice kind of full compact plant. So this is your Greek columnar basil. Uh, really, really good one. The Dolce Fresca, which I could have swore I grabbed, but I don't see it now, is a new one of my favorites. Really nice kind of you know, full shape to it. It's a really, really good variety, um, and it's a little bit slower to bolt. So why did I grab that basil seed? Let me talk about seed here again one more time, and I'll talk about it, you know, or I'll mention it again when we get to cilantro, or maybe let's just do cilantro with this. So here's my cilantro. Cilantro looks very, very much like parsley. It's almost hard to tell the difference. A little bit more of a serrated edge, but cilantro is absolutely amazing. Um, used in a lot of you know, Mexican dishes um, and, and just really, really easy uh, to you know, add to your salsas or lots and lots of different types of dishes. It's got that great aroma. Some people actually say that it tastes like soap to them. Uh, so good news to me is it doesn't taste like soap to me, but it's a really, really good one for all of those awesome summer dishes that we all think about. So cilantro is a great one, uh, just a, an amazing aroma. Cilantro, I think the biggest issue is always that it bolts quickly. So the Santo cilantro, or this is lemon cilantro. I grabbed the wrong one. Santo cilantro is the one that bolts, uh, that takes the longest to bolt. So that's usually my favorite. This one's lemon, which is really nice. So it's a little bit different. You know, it's got that kind of, I always kind of describe cilantro as like the beefed up parsley. You know, it tastes similar to parsley, but it's a much, much bolder taste. And here's parsley, just so you can see the difference. Not that you can see much. But you see how this one's a little bit of a shinier uh, leaf and it's got a lot more serration in its lobes, whereas this one is a little bit more smooth edged. Um, but cilantro is a great one. So the reason I bring up seeds is similar to, um, similar to, to cucumbers. I talk about this a lot with cucumbers is sometimes I like to grow them from seed because I can stagger my growth. So I can do, I can set a new one in, you know, a new group of cilantro or a new group of basil 
every two to three weeks. And that way I've got a little bit of a progression period because a lot of times you get that bumper crop like you do with cucumbers. Same with, you know, almost basil and cilantro. You get a big boost of growth. You get this gorgeous. It really comes to life. Um, and then it can go to bolt fairly quickly. Uh, and so if you're staggering your planting times then you get more of a staggered bolting time as well. Now, eventually you get into summer um, and it's kind of gone. Uh, but then you can plant it again in late summer and you've got another great season to grow it in, in the fall. Fall's an amazing time to, to start uh, your cilantro and your basil. Also, not too hard to grow inside. I will say basil is a little bit easier. Cilantro is a little bit more finicky. Uh, indoors, your biggest issue is you don't have as much sun and you don't have uh, as much evaporation. So typically indoors, we overwater is almost always the problem. Herbs aren't going to use as much water inside, but people have really good success with thyme um, and uh, even uh, mints inside and basil is another good one. So those are really, really good ones to grow indoors. Um, all right, let's move on to, so that's kind of my tip on cilantro and basil is maybe get some seeds and stagger your, your planting times. But sometimes you just get to that season and it's like, man, I don't need, I, I don't need basil anymore. I'll just have to wait until the, it cools down a little bit. And as I mentioned earlier, my biggest tip, grow them in containers because you can bring them into a cooler spot. You know, oh man, all of a sudden the temperature is spiking to 100 degrees, my basil looks great. Maybe bring it inside and grow it in a sunny window for a week and then you can take it back out if the temperatures cool back down. That'll keep that soil temperature down and prevent your plant from bolting because that's really what it is, is yes, some of it does rely on the length of the daylight, but a lot of it is, is soil temperature and the heat on the plant and the plant saying, uh oh, I'm going into a hot time frame. I need to flower. I need to seed. I need to reproduce because my time might be coming to an end. Uh, not necessarily always true. Get it through that heat of the, the summer and you might see those green leaves reproduce pretty quickly for you in the cooler weather. Um, so let's go on to, um, let me talk real quick. Let's do this because this is a fun one to kind of, to, to kind of talk about a little bit. And, and it brings in, of course, two of the most popular herbs. Well, one of them, two different types. Parsley. So I'm going to talk about parsley. I'm going to group some things here together so we can kind of talk about some different cool things. But parsley, fennel, and dill. So what do we think we're going to talk about here? So butterflies, of course. Um, so that's what's really cool about herbs is not only do they provide us with nutrition and flavor. And, you know, one of my favorite things is, uh, you know, every time the doctor says, you know, you need to stop you know, using so much salt. You know, you need to try and reduce the amount of salt that you take. So what's your best example to, to liven up your food? It's spices, it's, it's herbs. And so when you're trying to eliminate salt out of your diet, maybe not eliminate it completely, but cut it back some, then herbs are a great place to go to because they can really liven up and, and add a ton of flavor so that you can reduce some of that salt. So it's healthier. And a lot of them, like oregano is a great example, have been known to have really, really good uh, health benefits as, as, as far as preventing cancers and a lot of different things. Um, mint is something that gets you kind of motivated and keeps your energy up um, and is a great sugar replacement. So lots and lots of benefits, health benefits. I won't go into a whole list, but they're there and they're amazing. So not only are herbs very healthy for us, but they're also super healthy for the ecosystem. And that's what I love. Our natural native wildlife loves herbs. A lot of them flower. Here's a great example of this lavender right behind me that's blooming. Here's another gorgeous lavender. Let's see if I can pick this up and show you. So you can see that, those blooms right there. Hummingbirds will get attracted to some of these, but butterflies love them and bees are just swarming on them. If you've ever seen a thyme bloom, the bees are just all over it, so they absolutely love it. So it's a great nectar plant, a uh, great uh, uh, pollen plant for our local uh, bees, and so it's a great thing to add to a vegetable garden because you're attracting all of those pollinators uh, to your area. But what's really cool about parsley, fennel, and dill is they're the host plant, which means that is where the caterpillars will eat these plants. And so your swallowtails, we're really talking about, strictly talking about swallowtails, Monarchs, completely different subject. They need milkweed, separate, separate thing. Uh, but for our native swallowtails, they love these four here. Uh, you know, the, the curly leaf parsley, the flat Italian leaf parsley. A lot of people say the curly leaf doesn't get eaten as much. 
I haven't had that experience. I still see it get devoured. Uh, so what I always like to say is with, with dill and fennel, these are bigger plants, um, but because they can get some size on them, I want to say, let's see, this guy says um, two to four uh, feet wide. So really, you know, that's your spacing on them. But they, I've seen these get up to two to four feet tall. So uh, fennel and dill get pretty big, but you might plant a little bit of extra just because our little swallowtail friends are gonna come along. So what happens is the butterflies are attracted to your area because you've got the host plant for their babies. And so what they're gonna do is they're gonna lay eggs all over it. You're not gonna see them because they look like little tiny black dots. You'll barely even see them. But then they'll hatch, turn into a caterpillar, and the caterpillar is gonna crawl up the stem of the plant and eat the leaves off of all of these different plants. Um, but they're gonna get so big that basically they're going to get to the point where they've got enough food source and then they're gonna form their chrysalis and then they're gonna hatch into a swallowtail and the cycle continues over and over and over again. So with parsley, fill, uh, uh, dill, and fennel, plant a little extra for our uh, local swallowtails. So it's a great thing that you can do. So I love to kind of bring that in there. Uh, of course, parsley, Number one kind of probably herb that most people start with. It is a very, very easy one. I do consider it an annual in this area. However, a lot of people have success with it getting through the winter, which I, I have for many, many years. Uh, it depends on the temperatures and depends on the weather. I typically treat it as an annual, but I've seen a lot of people get you know two or three years out of one parsley plant. The curly leaf is just a different texture, a different look. The flat leaf is really, really good too. The reason that I love fresh parsley, whoop, Fresh parsley is because um, it um, is, is just a little bit more flavorful when it's, when it's um, fresh. So when you have dried parsley, it probably doesn't do much. So if all you've ever used is dry parsley and you don't really like it because it doesn't have a whole ton of flavor, try some fresh parsley. It's a completely different experience, I think. So parsley is a really, really good one, uh, one that I suggest trying because it's super, super easy. Uh, now, dill and fennel um, are awesome too. In fact, a lot of people will use the bulb of the fennel to, grow, to, to use in, in different types of culinary uh, uses. But dill is a great one for fish. I think a lot of people use it for fish and different types of soups. Um, and fennel is just awesome as well. Um, and this is the bronze fennel, which is a really, really pretty plant. So really, really nice ones. Dill and fennel, very, very popular and kind of helped me lead me into that, that conversation of, of helping our ecosystem. Uh, so let's talk about, now I'll group another group of plants, which is gonna be lavender. Lots of different types of lavenders, and you can see them all around me. And rosemary, I'm going to use that one as well. And it kind of will lead me into another discussion that we can talk about too. Um, where's my rosemary? I think it's down here. Here's my rosemary. So one of my favorite rosemaries is barbecue rosemary. Let's start with rosemary. So these are, of course, Mediterranean herbs. So you think of, uh, you know, Italy. Uh, you think of you know Greece. You think of you know these big hills with you know mounds of lavender, um, just gorgeous terracotta. You know kind of what I've got set up here. And you think of rosemary and lavender, and so they love um, that arid, dry weather. So we've got the dry, we've got the heat, just like the Mediterranean does. What we don't have is the low humidity. So typically what's gonna happen if you ever have failures with rosemary and lavender is the humidity level gets too high. And so what you wanna do is make sure that you've got a very well-drained soil because what is humidity really coming from? Humidity is coming from you know, the soil is holding moisture and it's getting evaporated when we get hot. So all of that, that moisture feels like it's coming upward, right? We all feel that in the summer, you know, ourselves personally, that humidity just feels like it's coming at you from underneath and that is what a humidity is to plants, basically. So, you know, think of like a humidity tray. If we're talking about a humidity tray, it's basically a, a saucer with rock, and, and you fill it with moisture, and then you, put, you fill it with water, and then you put your container on top of it. And what happens is that moisture, that, that water, is gonna evaporate and create a humidity situation in that local little area. Same thing in our soil, same thing in our yard, same thing in our garden. So a lot of people have very good success with growing lavender, because lavender is probably the more finicky of the two, uh, in containers. Now, if you've got a good arid space that gets good airflow, airflow is a really, really important one uh, when we talk about growing lavender and trying to keep that humidity down. Um, so you wanna make sure you've got plenty of airflow around your plants. You can grow these together in like a little low growing hedge. Uh, they make amazing little hedges. They're a great landscape plant, 
Um, but typically that's where people fail is it's a wet area and so that humidity just never goes away uh, no matter what you do. So you got to make sure it's a very well drained area, gets plenty of sunlight. You got to keep it watered sometimes, but you got to let it dry out other times. So it's kind of a tricky, tricky one. Uh, but I love it in containers. Really that amazing aroma is just something that you just love to have around. Rosemary, lots and lots of uses for that. We use it in a lot of dishes. I love it on meats. The barbecue rosemary is one of my favorites because it's a little bit more upright habit. It can spread a little bit. It can get a, you know, a, good, bur uh, a good width on it. Uh, but rosemary barbecue I love because it gets these long skewer sized stems, which literally means you can use it to skewer your meat. So it's a really, really cool one. I like to just cut off a piece, lay it right on top of a steak. Really, really good on the grill. Um, so bar barbecue rosemary, one of my go-tos for the rosemaries. There's lots and lots of different types. This is one of the most popular, has been for a long time, is the Tuscan Blue Rosemary. And that is what you see right here. I don't think you can quite see it on camera, but this is a big one, really gorgeous and blooming. There's other types of rosemary, and there's so many different types of rosemary. Um, and they're pretty easy. They take our humidity a little bit better than the lavender does, um, but they, uh, they can get some pretty good size to them. And they're great landscape plants. So they can take it dry, they can take a little bit heavier moisture, a little bit higher humidity, they're okay with that. But they do like that arid, dry temperature as well um, and, and climate. So uh, you know, you're definitely fine with that with rosemary and lavender definitely is a little bit more on the finicky side of that. But there's lots and lots of different types. Look at this creeping rosemary I've got growing in this hanging basket. Absolutely stunning. So you can grow these in hanging baskets, you can grow them in containers grow them in the ground, uh, make great landscape plants. So I kind of pair rosemary and lavender together because they're evergreen, they're more woody, so they're gonna get a little bigger, they're more shrub-like. We also have the French lavender in, which is much lighter, much different. It's just an amazing fragrance. So really, really cool. We've got a great selection of lavenders for sure right now, and big ones too. I mean, check out this guy. This one is really stunning. Look at that silvery gray foliage. So this one is called, See if I can get the variety on it for you. Silver Anouk. So this is a Spanish lavender. Look at that, just absolutely stunning. I'm just gonna show you a couple more. Look at that guy blooming with those really, really pretty uh, purple to lilac blooms. I love the bud because it gets that nice long bud and it's got those little fla flowers that pop out of it. Really, really cool look. And this one is also a Span Spanish lavender. It's called Deep Purple Spanish Lavender. This one is really cool. I gotta show you this one. Love that. That just dome-shaped kind of really cool, that gray foliage. Let's see if I can get the, this is also silver and oak. So look at that. Two different growth habits, same exact plant. So you can see, you know, different, probably grown a little bit more of a different climate, a little bit maybe probably on the shadier side, it's stretching for light. This was maybe grown in more full sun, so it's got a little bit of a tighter compact habit. Probably a little bit older, a little bit younger, so grown for, 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 for size, so probably pumped with a little bit of nitrogen to get this one up to size. But then this one was probably let to grow, naturally grow in nice, nice full sun area. And just look at that, absolutely gorgeous. So love lavenders because of the fragrance when you walk by. You know, love to r rub my hands in it and just have that aroma and fragrance. Really, really cool. All right, so that leads me into a next group that I'll talk about. And that's going to be some of our, our different herbs here, like lemon verbena. Then we've got our lemon grass. You see where I'm going with this? Um, and then, let's see, where did I put it? Lemon balm. <laughs> um, so these are some of my good ones. And then I'll even throw in, I don't know what else I would throw into this. Probably, probably just keep these three here. Well, I do have the lemon thyme. So we've got some lemon scented, uh, some lemon uh, types of herbs, and these are really, really great. And what I love about these, oh, that's what I was gonna talk about, is this geranium, scented geranium. Now these actually used to be grown, um, or really a lot of people used to use them to like, kind of almost you know, add a little bit of, of flavor to like cakes and breads and stuff, but really now it's more grown uh, to ward off our insects. Hence, all of these are. So if I was gonna plant a mosquito planter, uh, something that's gonna repel mosquitoes, not attract them, then these would be some of the plants I would use for sure. You know, lemon verbena, the lemon grass, and the mosquito plant, the citronella geranium. So this is just an awesome fragrance. Um, and what's cool about all herbs, and that's why I wanted to talk about this, because this is a great tip, is what's really nice about all herbs is 
almost all of them really kind of repel insects. So what that means is it repels the bad insects out of your yard. It does attract good insects like our swallowtails we just mentioned. And it also attracts, you know, the butterflies and the bees when they're blooming for nectar sources. Um, but um, it will deter the bad insects. And what that means is we rarely have issues with aphids, mealybug, you know, any of those things. Plus, we're trying to keep the mosquitoes away. So that's what's so cool about these is you can push those mosquitoes away a little bit with some of these herbs. So, of course, lemongrass is just absolutely gorgeous. This actually can put some pretty nice size on it. Um, it is tender in this area, so you got to watch out for the winters. But a lot of times people have success getting it through the winter. But lemongrass is a good one. And I just love the arching blades that you get. This thing can get some size on it. So really, really nice. And we carry big ones. We also carry the smaller four inch starter size, but I love lemongrass. Great for a lot of those Asian inspired dishes that you're doing. Um, lemon verbena is a really, really good one. A lot of people use this for teas. Uh, really, really, you know, all your tea herbs like uh, mint and lemon verbena and lemon balm are really to soothe you. I mean, tea is designed to soothe you. So a lot of people dry their herbs, use them fresh in teas uh, because they just really, really help kind of calm your nerves and make you feel good. Um, and that's what tea is great for. Plus the health benefits, of course, are in there as well. Um, but lemon verbena is a great repellent of insects and just a really different fragrance, kind of more earthy, but on that lemon scented fresh, it's just got a fresh smell to it. So I love lemon verbena. And then of course, lemon balm, another great one for teas. Great fragrance and it'll keep the mosquitoes away and it's a little bit lower growing, a little bit bushier. So lemon balm is a good one. Uh, and of course, I'm not gonna talk about every single herb today. I'm just gonna talk about some of my favorites. So I will quickly try and talk about mint because mint is a very, very popular one. So let's see if I can pull this up here. Now, mint is a spreading herb. So it is a spreader, it's aggressive. And there's lots and lots of different types. So I've got peppermint. You can see that look. Look at that runner right there. Just ready to hit the ground and start going crazy. So we've got peppermint. We've got spearmint. Just all of these different types of really, really great mints. Apple mint. A little bit of a fuzzier leaf. A little bit of lighter fragrance. And then we've got our chocolate mint with that really nice dark maroon leaf. Great fragrance. And then my number one all-time go-to is the mojito mint. The reason I love the mojito mint is because it kind of encompasses the benefits of everything. It's got a nice big leaf, amazing fragrance. I mean, it's just a pure mint fragrance. So it kind of gives you a little bit of that spearmint, slightly peppermint, um, but it's got that big, huge leaf. So it's great for mojitos, obviously. So for our drinks, but also great for teas, uh, cooking in some desserts. Uh, mint is a great herb to have around. Now, how do you control mint? Well, the best way is probably to grow in a container. I've got one trick for you. When you grow in a container, because it's so aggressive, mint is, then cover up your hole with a piece of weed fabric, landscape fabric. I know a lot of us have it laying around, but just a little bit of a square of that will prevent moisture, so you don't wanna stop moisture from coming out your drain hole, but you do wanna prevent the root system of mint from coming out of your drain hole because it's that aggressive. So um, some way to do that, you can also use some rock maybe if you want to, or even a coffee filter a lot of people have used, but eventually the coffee filter is gonna biodegrade and it's gonna pump, pump right through it. So just be careful with it, just keep it maybe on a couple bricks, that's another great solution, is just put a couple bricks down so it's got a nice hard surface so when that root system comes out that bottom hole, it doesn't hit soil and start running. Also, keep your trailers off. So, great example was that peppermint. You know, keep this guy, because it'll trail over the side and it's really pretty looking, but if this hits soil, it's gonna take off. Now, maybe you have a big area that you wanna grow mint in. Uh, maybe you've got the space and the, the, you know, an area where you've had a hard time growing something. Mint is another great one for low sun. So if we don't have a whole lot of sunlight, um, it's a really, really nice one to uh, keep the sun. If you don't have as much sun, it, it, it's easier to grow in that area. Um, but mint is really, really good. It actually can take pretty moist situations as well. But if you plant it in your landscape, it's going to spread. Um, it's not super hard to control. 
So, I mean, we can go out and kill it with any kind of liquid uh, killer, um, but it is going to spread and it's going to spread pretty quickly. So, a lot of us grow it in containers. That's what I would recommend if you're a beginner. Um, if you're somebody that wants it in their landscape and wants to cover up some ground space, uh, maybe a natural lawn, um, maybe they've got an area where they just can't grow anything and it's big and they just don't know what else to do, you can plant mint there. It'll grow there. It grows anywhere. So, a really, really good one is mint. Um, let's see, let me move on to oregano. So oregano, really popular in your Italian dishes. You think of it in pizzas and sauces and soups. Um, lots of different types here. I love the Greek oregano, really, really nice one. Uh, we also carry the Italian oregano. So we've got two of those. And then one that is becoming faster and faster, my most favorite, is the hot and spicy. So just a little bit of a ramped up oregano, which I always like is so I don't have to use as much maybe. I can just go pick a couple stems and I'm ready to go with my oregano dish. Um, but oregano hot and spicy is a really, really nice one. Uh, so that's a great one to try. And then of course Greek and um, Italian are also great varieties of oregano. Oregano is a great one because it's evergreen um, or sometimes it'll die. No, it does die back, sorry. But it's a perennial, it comes back every year. So oregano is a really, really good one. Um, and of course, pair that with thyme. I think I got my thyme way over here. So we've got our English thyme here. English, of course, is the quintessential thyme. A little bit bushier, but also can kind of trail a little bit. There's lots and lots of different types of thyme. Um, and it's a really, really easy one to grow and it's evergreen. These actually make great ground covers. Uh, can take a little bit of shade, but it's a really dry, it, it's a drought tolerant herb because it's a small leaf, so it's not gonna need a ton of moisture. So if you're looking for a great landscape herb, this is a really, really good one. A lot of times will even grow very, very flat and grow in between rocks. Um, like woolly thyme. Now, most of those aren't used for culinary purposes, but just to describe to you how easy it is to grow, um, that's a great benefit and they're evergreen. So this is that, that lemon variegated thyme. Absolutely stunning. These are great in a lot of dishes, poultry to fish. You can use them pretty much for anything. It's one of probably one of the most used herbs other than parsley. So thyme is a great one. I'll quickly talk about a couple of my other last favorites here before I kind of wrap this up. Chives are a really, really easy one. Um, chives give you that, that onion flavor in a quick kind of fix. Uh, great for salads, great for just, you know, lightly cutting up some on top of uh, a soup. Um, you know, I even use them on sandwiches sometimes to give me that little onion fra uh, flavor. Really, really great one for the herb scissors because I can just go out, cut off a couple, you know, a little chunk and then just go in there and just chop them up right over top of something. And it's just an easy one to use. And these are super easy to grow. And I've got some that are probably three years old. I mean, I literally neglect them. I mean, you know, think of wild onions. Onions, you know, grow very, very easily. Um, and they get these great blooms on them. So chives are a really, really nice one. Really, really great fragrance. Um, you get your garlic chives too. I don't have any right now, or at least I didn't see any out there when I was picking these up. Garlic chives have a white bloom. So whenever you're buying your, your chives, if it doesn't say, look at the picture, the picture on this one's got purple blooms, so or purplish pink blooms. Um, so that's gonna be your onion chives. Garlic chives are white blooms. So great way to kind of tell the difference there on chives. Uh, I saw a question on mint. Brooke said, does the mint only spread by roots or does it spread by seeds as well? Um, typically, it, it only spreads by runners. Um, I'm sure if it flowered and did seed, um, that it would spread that way as well. But typically, it spreads by runners and it spreads by top and underneath. So you're gonna get runners underneath the soil. Where did my mint go? And that's why I grabbed this one, it's a great example. So you're gonna get these, and then also underneath the ground, you're gonna get what they call stolons. You're gonna get runners underneath the ground that are gonna shoot sideways and you're gonna start seeing it pop up. So yes, it can spread. But it's not anything like too crazy. I mean, I definitely had some mint in a pot um, that had spilled over the side and started to take over. I had it sitting in a strawberry patch and it kind of took over the strawberry patch. Another great ground cover is strawberries, uh, but they all do spread. But I was able to eliminate it when I wanted to. I had to eliminate my strawberry patch as well, but I needed to to restart it. So long story short is it's not like bamboo. <laughs> it's not some invasive species that you're never gonna get rid of. It's pretty easy to control if we have to. If you're just sick of it, um, then we can get rid of it. Uh, but I would say if you're concerned about it taking over, because it'll take over pretty much any bare space that you got, um, it, uh, then, then I would grow it in the container. It's the best way to do it. Just so you don't have to worry about it. Um, all right. 
There was a couple other that, oh, Sage. Gotta talk about Sage. Sage is another really great one, really great drought tolerant. Of course, we think of this around Thanksgiving for our you know turkey dinner, um, but Sage is an awesome one. And actually, a lot of people use them in breads. Uh, really great fragrance, a little bit more on the earthy side, uh, but Sage is a really, really good one. This is Burgotten, which is one of the best varieties. And then this is our Purple Sage. So you get a little bit of that kind of purple stem in it. And as this one gets older, you'll see a little bit more of that purple color come out. A little bit smaller leaf. I like the big Burgotten Sage because it's got that big leaf on it, easy to use. And then you can see as it gets a little bit older, this is a little bit bigger one. I think this is the Burgotten, yeah, Burgotten as well. So just awesome, awesome leaf and pretty drought tolerant and can get some good size on it. And really is another one of those great ones for the landscape. I love sage in the landscape. Looks really, really cool. It's evergreen, pretty easy to grow. So, you know, whenever we're talking about, you know, growing some herbs that are gonna last, you know, I always think about thyme, oregano, sage, parsley even sometimes will make it through the winters. Um, and some, some of those are some of the best. Let's see, did I miss anything? I think I got everything. We talked about rosemary, lavender. Talked about my sages. I think we got pretty much everything um, as far as my favorites go. Now, those are just my favorites. There's a hundred other, you know, uh, types. Oh, this is the last one I didn't talk about. Stevia. You know, I talked about all the health benefits. Stevia is nature's sweet uh, sweet herb, basically what they call it. So it's basically 300 times sweeter than sugar. So it's a really, really good one uh, because if you're trying to sweeten up your sweet tea, like I, I'm not a huge fan of just regular tea. I love sweet tea. And so instead of adding sugar, you can just add stevia. It's a really, really nice addition. It's a little bit of a different flavor, but you get that sweetness factor out of it. Um, and it's much, much healthier. So when we're talking about trying to eliminate salt using herbs, it's a great way of doing it. Spice up your food rather than using salt, use some herbs that are going to have a lot of other health benefits. Stevia is another great example of that when it comes to eliminating sugar from our diet. So just want to throw that one out. That's another great tip. These are just some of my favorites. Um, there's lots and lots of other ones and there's lots and lots of uses for them. I mean, I could talk for hours and hours and hours, probably about a couple of different herbs, but um, do a little bit of research. I hope these tips and tricks help you out. You're not going to have to worry about too many insect issues. If you ever have any disease issues, let us know. Um, you know, neem oil is something that I always keep around, triple action. Um, neem oil is a great organic one that helps suffocate, be preventative rather than curative. So let me see, I think I got a bottle of it right here. Oh, that's an insecticide, which we're not going to use a whole lot uh, when it comes to herbs because really it's going to repel a lot of insects and the only insects that it typically is going to invite in are going to be the good insects. Um, so neem oil is a great one as a uh, basically a suffocant so it's going to suffocate. Sometimes basil will get a leaf spot on it um, but really you know most herbs don't have a lot of issues. Um, maybe you'll get some slugs in sometimes here and there but even slugs don't mess with herbs that much. Um, so it's a really, really easy one to, to, to grow. And when I talk about, you know, a, an edible garden, and if you're just getting into it, I always talk about herbs because it's one of my favorite go-tos. It's easy, it's user-friendly. Um, they're a lot of fun to grow in containers and scatter around. So, you know, this is a great little setup here that I got, um, but you can do this very simply. You know, just buy a bunch of clay, Pots, it could be terracotta, could be plastic, uh, you know, could be grow in a ceramic pot. Grow them in your raised bed, mix them in with your vegetables, uh, mix them into your landscape. That's what's so cool about herbs is they're extremely versatile. And then we could talk, uh, you know, hours and hours about the culinary purposes of them. Um, I won't get into all that detail. I want to make you successful. I want you to go have fun with them. Try some out. You know, pick some of your, you know, think about what you use, your dried herb shelf. You know, you got all those little canisters um, of dried herbs from like McCormick and stuff like that. Um, so think about those that you use all the time. You know, if you're using a lot of garlic, um, garlic powder, then you might try the garlic chives. Um, if you're using, you know, dried parsley or an Italian seasoning, Italian seasoning is going to be oregano, thyme, basil. So those are easy ones that you can grow. And when you grow fresh herbs and you try them in your cooking, you're going to love it and you're never going to go back and you might start to grow more and then you might start trying to dry them or can them or freeze them or all those great benefits that you can do with herbs. So you got a lot, a lot of options there. You might even start going into the seed. You might even start forming rows in your yard. So 
Herbs are so easy. It's a great way to get into your edible garden. So I hope you all enjoy this. I hope I didn't see many, many questions. So I'm assuming that's because I answered all of your questions. It was a perfect webinar, right? No issues. Um, but if you have any further questions, let me know. Um, but if not, then I will sign off and let you get out and enjoy uh, the spring weather. And, and hopefully come and see us here at McDonald Garden Center. Pick up some of these great plants um, and lots and lots of choices that you can choose from. Uh, pick up all your essentials to create your own herb garden. No matter where you want to put it, we'll help you. So come and see us here at McDonald Garden Center. All right, everybody. I hope you have a great day. Enjoy the rest of your week and your weekend. And we'll see you next week for our live webinar series as we continue to do this. Um, hopefully you all enjoy this and I'll talk to you later.